Was Sharam Amiri a spy or a prisoner? The bizarre story of an Iranian scientist who went missing for more than a year before turning up in Washington, D.C. is yet to be fully explained. It has, though, once again thrown sharp focus on the debate about Iran's nuclear capabilities and the extent to which some intelligence agencies could go to find out more about them. What lies behind this murky case? And could it cast some light on whether or not Iran is intent on developing a nuclear weapon? This is Inside Story. Hello, I'm Mike Hanna. Welcome to the program. The man some describe as an Iranian nuclear scientist, Sharam Amiri, has left the United States. He'd vanished over a year ago, then suddenly reappeared with two completely contradictory stories about the events of his past year, triggering a propaganda war between the United States and Iran. Rosalind Jordan has more. On Tuesday, Iranian nuclear scientist Shahram Amiri spoke for the first time to a reporter about what he says was his abduction more than a year ago. There were three people in the van, a driver, another person in a formal suit and beard, and a third person in the back. When I opened the door to get in and sit down, the person at the back put a gun to my side and said, please be quiet, don't make any noise. Amiri's comments did little, though, to clear up the confusion about where he's been and with whom since June 2009, when he vanished during the annual Hajj in Saudi Arabia. Amiri hadn't been heard from until recently when he appeared in several videos released online where he either accused Saudi and American agents of having kidnapped him or reassured those watching that he was in school and enjoying life. On Monday evening, Amiri turned up at the Iranian interest section offices in Washington. Iranian television quoted him as saying he had escaped from his American captors and that he wanted to go home. Obama administration officials denied Amiri's allegations he had been kidnapped. He is here of his uh, own volition and he has chosen to return to Iran of his own volition. That is how we do things here in the United States. We didn't, we didn't seize him and bring him here. And when she was asked about Amiri, the U.S. Secretary of State chose instead to focus on the fate of four American citizens now detained by Iran. Iran continues to hold three young Americans against their will, and we reiterate our request that they be released uh, and allowed to return to their families on a humanitarian basis. And we also continue to have no information on the welfare and whereabouts of Robert Levinson, who has been missing in Iran since 2007. Amiri's case is notable because it's been alleged he gave the U.S. information about Iran's nuclear program, one which Washington has charged is focused on building weapons. And in the year that Amiri was missing, Washington convinced the U.N. Security Council to approve as punishment a fourth round of economic sanctions against Tehran. But with Washington refusing to confirm what dealings it did have with Amiri in the past year, the reasons for the scientist's disappearance and now his sudden reappearance continue to be a mystery. Rosalind Jordan, Al Jazeera, Washington. Well, joining me to discuss these events in Washington, D.C., Ray McGovern, a former analyst at the Central Intelligence Agency. In London, Mark Fitzpatrick, director of the Non-Proliferation Program in the International Institute for Strategic Studies. And in Beirut, Saeed Mohammed Mirandi, head of North American Studies at Tehran University. Welcome to you all. Let's begin in Beirut. Saeed Mohammed Mirandi, what is the general Iranian view? Is it that Shiram Amiri was taken to the U.S. against his will? And if so, why? Yes, I think for the most part, Iranians believe that uh, he was abducted, and uh, that is partially because the Americans throughout this ordeal have been very late in making, it, making any statements. And the uh, video that came out where he said that he was uh, there at, in the United States on his own will uh, came after the first uh, video where he said he was abducted. It, ca it came uh, literally hours after the first video. And he was reading from a script, apparently. That's how it looked. So Iranians feel that uh, this was a case where the United States 
had abducted uh, a person, and since the Americans have done this on many occasions in the past, extraordinary rendition and so on, it's a believable story. Well, Ray McGovern in Washington, D.C., according to reports, Amiri was dropped off at the uh, Pakistan embassy there in the hours of the early evening. Uh, what's, what's your view? What, what are the reasons do you believe are behind his disappearance and sudden appearance? Well, I would first say that uh, my colleague in Beirut, who just spoke to you, uh, has, it, uh, has it completely right. Uh, the two ostensibly contradictory videos that this man made were <coughs> released. <coughs> the second one was released within hours of the first. And the second one was highly polished. And even the Washington Post this morning uh, says that uh, the CIA helped produce that video. So here you have a highly polished video of a defector saying, I'm here of my own free will. And uh, we have two other uh, contradictory um, uh, interviews that uh, you can pick which ones you believe. I think the important thing is to to guess, and it is guesswork here. This is smoke and mirrors, but I think I think it's reasonable to speculate that the reason that uh, Mr. Amiri ended up in the United States is because the United States intelligence agencies uh, desperately need some kind of proof that Iran is working on a nuclear weapon, not necessarily a nuclear program, but the warhead part of a nuclear weapon. Now, the intelligence agencies pronounced themselves on this in November of 2007 and said that Iran had stopped working on the nuclear weapon part of their program in the fall of 2003, so four years before. That judgment stands. There is an estimate underway now uh, that is going to update those judgments and what, uh, what the administration and what the Israel lobby would dearly love to have is some kind of Iranian defector with some pretense to knowledge about nuclear affairs telling us, oh, Iran, contrary to what we all thought, they're just about next month or the following month about to get a nuclear weapon. I think that was what drove all this, and that's the context into which we must put this. Well, we'll be looking further at those particular issues, uh, but one must remember as well that in some cases it's a question of history repeating itself. A quarter of a century ago, a Soviet defector, Vitaly Yuchenko, arrived in Washington. Uh, he defected to the U.S. and then changed his mind, was returned to the um, Soviet Union. Really similar circumstances, it would appear. But Mark Fitzpatrick in uh, London, we heard there from Ray McGovern arguing that this could well be a case of the U.S. producing its uh, defector, that the U.S. is in fact behind this whole affair. Your view? Oh, I don't think uh, any of the guests uh, know exactly what happened, but I think your reference to uh, the Soviet spy 25 years ago is a good departure point. You know, that spy was not uh, drugged and abducted from the Soviet Union. He was persuaded uh, to defect, and I think it's, uh, it's highly probable that Mr. Amiri was similarly uh, persuaded to defect. Um, he had information about uh, the clandestine until then, clandestine plant at Fardo. It wasn't the nuclear weapons uh, part that uh, one of your guests spoke about. It was a secret facility for the enrichment of uranium. And because he confirmed to the U.S. intelligence agencies the existence of the plant, uh, President Obama and uh, President Medvedev were able to disclose that plant to the world uh, a year ago. And that uh, led to the unraveling again of Iran's story. And it led to the nations of the world to decide that Iran had to be persuaded with tougher sanctions to give up this uh, nuclear weapons uh, capability uh, development program. So in a way, I think you know, Mr. Amiri uh, contributed to an important uh, revelation about Iran's program. There's a lot more that's not known about it. I hope more Iranian scientists uh, come forward to disclose. Uh, certainly, um, the CIA is looking for additional information. I don't think the case is clear-cut exactly what Iran is up to, other than that they certainly are trying to get a nuclear weapons capability. Whether they are, they are taking the additional step to cross the line and produce nuclear weapons is a very important question uh, on which 
uh, life or death uh, will hinge, or whether there's a war in the Middle East again or not. If Iran crosses that line to produce nuclear weapons, I think war could break out. And information about Iran's system will be very important to contributing to decision making. Uh, Ray McGovern, do you have something capitals. to say then, Washington, D.C.? <laughs> yes, I, I would uh, respectfully disagree with Mark. Um, there's a quite a bit of hyperbole attached to the notion that if Iran got a nuclear weapon, <clears throat> this would be the end of the world. It would not be the end of the world. Um, well, now, I didn't say that. I said, I said war might break out. You said war would break out. Um, getting back I to think, Mr. Amiri, well, I don't think it should unless the United States lets Israel go ahead and start a war. Now, getting back to Mr. Amiri, there is no evidence no evidence at all that, number one, he had access to that kind of information or that he was the person that told the United States government about COM, that nuclear facility. We knew about COM years ago. We chose to reveal it before that big summit. Uh, and uh, it's, it's preposterous to suggest, as David Albright and so, some of the others are suggesting, that this fellow who worked in a research institute across the street from a, 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 an Iranian atomic uh, energy facility, that he would have been in a position to know these things, 32 years old, that he would be a source of this kind of information. Uh, there's no evidence of that, and there's a lot of... Uh, uh, mis misinformation percolating around. Well, let's just uh, recap the sequence of events that has led to all of this. The International Atomic uh, Energy Agency, the U.S. and its allies, suspect Iran is trying to build a nuclear weapon, an allegation uh, Iran has repeatedly rejected. The issue's long been bitterly argued on all sides. But let's just look at the sequence of events since the disappearance of Sharam Amiri in June last year. In September 2009, Iran publicly confirmed the existence of a previously undeclared nuclear facility in Qum. As we heard, Washington then claimed it had been aware of the covert operation for several years. This followed by an IAEA statement that it believed Iran had, and I quote, sufficient information to make a nuclear device. Then in March this year, the IAEA reported that it had gathered extensive information about Iran's nuclear agenda from a variety of sources, information it said was a matter of concern. Two months later, Iran signed a uranium swap deal with Turkey and Brazil, one aimed at engaging Iran rather than threatening it. But this deal was brushed aside by the U.S. and its allies, and last month the U.N. Security Council formally rejected the deal and approved a fourth round of sanctions against Iran. Well, underlying all of this is the question, as we've heard from our guests, about the quality of the information that these type of decisions are taken on. Aside, Mohammed Mirandi in Beirut, how accurate, how much based is this type of information that bodies like the UN and its members, the US, are actually taking their decisions on? Well, I think the, uh, this recent ordeal is very revealing itself. Uh, the gentleman was 31 years old when he was abducted. And the Washington Post uh, a few months ago basically said that he was deeply informed about secret programs in Iran for over a decade which meant that effectively he was in high school or had just entered university when he was part of the Iranian nuclear program. So the propaganda that comes out of the American media and the American press is itself very revealing. It uh, reveals the direction that American society and American policymakers want to uh, take the situation, the route they want to take it down. But the fact is that Amiri wasn't even a a nuclear scientist. He was a, a person who did not have that expertise. And he, and the Fordu uh, installation, as p was pointed out m a couple of minutes ago, was actually revealed by Iran before anyone else revealed it. And it wasn't a secret installation. Iran, in accordance with international law, revealed it. The, the, but the important point, really, is that from the very start, the Iranian nuclear program, which began before the revolution, has been investigated for years by the IAEA, and there has been absolutely no evidence whatsoever to show that Iran's program is anything but peaceful. And the United, even, and this is despite the fact that the the board in the IAEA is dominated by Western countries, and just like the UN Security Council, which is dominated by a number of powers and really effectively led by the United States. 
So despite the fact that uh, these countries and the West is basically trying to find any sort of evidence to show that Iran's nuclear program is, 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 has a military aspect to it, they've, they failed in doing so. And the United States really is, has, has basically is arguing that Iran is developing a nuclear program and then it is searching for evidence whereas uh, a person is innocent unless proven guilty. So when it comes to Iran, uh, it's the other way around. But more importantly, I think, the problem really lies with U.S.-Iranian relations. The United States has a, a rather irrational hostility towards Iran that has begun since the revolution itself. And I think that the nuclear program the, and the American hostility that, uh, that exists within this framework is linked more to its broader relationship with, with Iran itself. Well, Mark Fitzpatrick, I saw you shaking your head very vehemently there, um, in particular that statement about Iran announcing the existence of the Qum facility before uh, the U.S. referred to it. What's your opinion? Well, uh, yes, uh, Iran uh, did tell the IAEA about two days before uh, President uh, Obama revealed it. Iran obviously uh, realized that the facility was about to be outed. They realized that Dr. Uh, Amiri uh, had been uh, missing and had probably revealed uh, the existence of this facility. Yes, U.S. intelligence agencies had a, had a fix on the agency, but they needed confirmation that it actually uh, was for enrichment purposes. And I think that's what Amiri probably uh, 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 provided. Iran had been violating international law, its IEA safeguards provisions, by not revealing the facility when it was first decided to build it. Just as Iran had violated its safeguards agreements for uh, for 18 years in 14 different ways. You know, the idea that there's absolutely no evidence that Iran is some pure country that didn't violate anything is, is obviously false. They, they violated their safeguards agreement. They claim that they uh, follow different rules, uh, different from anyone else follows, and therefore uh, they're in, in accordance with law. But that's because they decide to set their own rules. They, uh, you know, come up with this double standard that, uh, that they think is, uh, uh, you know, Cleans, makes them clean of any wrongdoing. Well, Ray There's McGovern, no a short proof. while ago, I just want to, to, to move on to a point or go back to a point that Ray McGovern brought out a short while ago, and that was the 2007 National Security Assessment. Now, um, the most recent one was um, Dennis Blair, the U.S. Director of National Intelligence, in February this year, and in his report he said, and I quote, Iran is technically capable of producing enough highly enriched uranium for a weapon in the next few years, and these are his words, if it chooses to do so. Now, Ray McGovern, this statement from the Director of National Intelligence would appear to imply that it has not yet chosen to do so. This does appear to be somewhat confusing, does it not? Well, it's not confusing to intelligence analysts. That is the opinion of the 16 agencies of the U.S. intelligence community, the U.S. government. That was uh, arrived at in November of, 20, of 2007, and a new <coughs> updated memorandum is being prepared as we speak. And they'd dearly love to have the equivalent of a screwball, um, not a screwball, but a curveball, okay? The kind of, the kind of uh, source that came out of the woodwork and told us all about those. Remember those mobile biological weapons laboratories that never existed? Well, perhaps they, they hoped that Mr. Amiri could give us equivalent information from sensitive sources inside Iran to change the estimate. Well, let me let just me go just to Mark Fitzpatrick on that particular point, Ray McGovern, and that is you brought up sure. there the issue of Iraq. Uh, the information that was provided to the U.S. public, to uh, Congress, uh, to the Senate about the weapons of mass production, of mass destruction in Iraq proved to be patently false. Is there not the possibility, or do you understand uh, the speculation at this particular point that information coming out of Iran on which decisions are being based could be equally inaccurate? Nobody, nobody that I know of in the U.S. government wants to see another kind of mistake like was made in Iraq. That's why they want to make sure that they have ample sources of information. All of the information collected by the IAEA, on which the Security Council and the Board of Governors base their decisions, and as much information as they can acquire from as many sources as possible. The 2007 National Intelligence Estimate was very 
carefully drafted so as not to reach conclusions that were unwarranted. It's under review right now. There's some evidence that shows that Iran has continued nuclear weapons design and development work since 2007, but it's not yet conclusive, I guess, or they would have come out, come out with something uh, by now. Well, well the it, fact exactly. that it is possible they, to... Yes, uh, uh, Look, if Ryan they McGovern. had something from a... If they had something from Amiri or anyone else, you could be darn sure that that as estimate would be completed within a month and uh, released to the American public. One step back here, okay? Iran agreed twice to ship out first 75 percent of its low enriched uranium and more recently with Turkey and Brazil agreed to ship out 50 percent of its low enriched uranium. Now, I would have thought that those concerned ostensibly about Iranian plans to build a nuclear weapon would have jumped up and down and said, wow, 50 percent. That means there's 50 percent less chance that Iran can have a nuclear weapon anytime soon. Instead of that, there are UN sanctions and there are threats of military activity. The objective is not fear, not fear of a nuclear program in Iran. The objective is regime change, pure and simple, and it's being directed mostly by the Israeli government and its uh, all too uh, impressionable subjects here in the United States. Well, Syed Mohammed Marandi in Beirut, I see you nodding your head on that particular point. Are you in agreement? Well, there's no doubt about that. Uh, when you look at the media in the United States, the assumption is that Iran has a nuclear weapons program. That is the assumption. And they are just seeking evidence, or at least manufacturing evidence, to prove the case. Where, in fact, if there's any evidence, uh, the United States should immediately provide the IAEA with that evidence. We'd all like to see it. If Iran is indeed producing a nuclear weapon, I, I for one, would like to see it. But the fact is that Iran's uh, uh, nuclear program is completely peaceful, and the United States has a really hard time dealing with that. Of course, within the United States and in England and in Europe, it's, easy to, it's easier to manipulate public opinion, but not in the Middle East and not in Iran itself. When you look at Iran's history, you see that Iran had a war with Saddam Hussein when the Europeans and the Americans provided Saddam Hussein with chemical weapons and the technology and the know-how to use weapons of mass destruction against the Iranian people. In response, the Iranian people never produced weapons of mass destruction. They never produced chemical weapons. And they have not produced chemical weapons even till today. And I think this shows that Iran's slate is very clean, while the Americans are very guilty of, of horrendous crimes against the Iranian people and the people of Iraq in the past. So it's, it's the Iranians who really uh, have a, a strong case, and it's the Americans who have a very dark past when it comes to Iran. But going back to the nuclear program, Shahram Amiri was not a nuclear scientist. He was a young person, and it is extraordinary that when he was abducted, when the Iranians claimed that he was abducted, human rights organizations in Europe and the United States did absolutely nothing. They didn't even question the U.S. government when it came to him. But if it was the other way around, you could, you could be absolutely certain that Western human rights organizations would be screaming and yelling that Iran was committing all sorts of atrocities. So the propaganda machine of the United States and, and its allies is very powerful. But for those who search the facts, there's absolutely no doubt that the Americans have no evidence whatsoever that Iran's program is anything but peaceful. Well, at Iran this point, is, we've Iran got to leave the discussion the there, Syed Mohammed Mirandi. Uh, that's all that we have time for at this particular point. The days ahead, no doubt, uh, may reveal more details, more facts, uh, replacing the speculation that many are indulging in at present. My thanks to our guests, Ray Thank McGovern you. in Washington, D.C., Mark Fitzpatrick in London and Syed Mohammed Mirandi in Beirut. And thank you so much for joining us here on this edition of Inside Story. We welcome your comments and suggestions. Please email them to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. I'm Mike Hanna. Goodbye for now.